Welcome to the continuation of Chapter 2. We're going to resume where we were when we were last uh, uh, speaking on this, pres or I was last uh, making a presentation. So this is the second uh, portion of Chapter 2. We were talking about sole proprietorship. Um, we talked about the two big characteristics of them, which, well, three big characteristics. The first is that there's only one owner. The second is that owner is personally liable. All of his or her assets are at jeopardy if there is any kind of judgment against the law firm or the sole proprietorship, whatever the nature of the business might be. Uh, the third characteristic is that it's very easy to establish. Now, sole proprietorships in this format are relatively rare for law firms. After all, there are other mechanisms that a lawyer can uh, use if he or she is planning to practice alone that manage that risk uh, more uh, that risk of personal liability more appropriately. Uh, the one I'm, I'm thinking about is the LLC, the Limited Liability Company Option. We'll talk a little bit about that here. We'll also talk about LLCs in much more detail in uh, the course uh, called Business Organizations. But w what can happen with an LLC or limited liability company format is that the um, one owner of the business, be it a law firm or taco stand or whatever, can um, significantly reduce his or her personal liability. And I, I said in the last lecture that one of the reasons why individuals who are starting a taco stand or a widget factory or whatever might initially have a sole proprietorship is they don't want to spend the money. They don't have a lot of money at this point. They're not making money with the business yet. There's going to be a period of time before it becomes profitable in, in most industries. So they want to be very careful about managing their resources during the short term. And once it becomes profitable, then they might be able to budget for an attorney. But, of course, an attorney doesn't need to hire another attorney in order to establish his LLC or his uh, professional corporation or whatever the structure is. So uh, a lawyer who has a sole proprietorship um, is kind of being lazy. He could have organized in such a way to minimize that personal liability in a much more effective mechanism. So uh, sole proprietorship is, is common as a business model in the non-legal uh, environment, but relatively rare in the um, law firm environment. Okay, let's talk about the next choice, partnership. A partnership, uh, there's actually two categories of partners. partnerships. The first one we'll call a general partnership. It's very similar to a sole proprietorship, except there's more than one owner. That's the big distinction. Um, with a general partnership, you have though the same aspects. It's very easy to create, and the owners, in this case called partners, have unlimited personal liability. Uh, so it has those two characteristics. The distinction, of course, is that a partnership has more than one owner, whereas the sole proprietorship only has one owner. That's what's called a general partnership. And... Um, that relates to the personal liability. So I'm going to call that general, sorry, this isn't turning out very well. General, this is a general partnership. But there's another type of partnership, which is called a limited liability partnership, an LLP is commonly what it's called. And in this mechanism, uh, there's more formalities that the partnership has to undergo. It, it does involve some, uh, it doesn't have to be done by attorneys, but it does involve some legal uh, paperwork filing and things along those lines. But uh, the big benefit to that is, guess what? The partners no longer have their personal assets in jeopardy if the partnership goes south. Imagine, for, us, for example, that I enter into a partnership with Bob. Bob and I establish a taco stand. Um, I happen to win the lottery, and I have $10 million sitting in my bank account. Well, um, on a particular morning, um, I forget to uh, uh, remove the ice from the front stoop, and, and Sally comes in, and she slips on the ice, and she breaks her leg, and it's a bad break. It doesn't heal right. There's lots and lots of medical bills associated with it. She wants to sue me for it. I don't have um, insurance, and so she wants to sue me for that $10 million that I got from the lottery. Well, if, I had, if we, are, we had a general partnership, she could well be successful at that. But no, too bad for Sally, we have a limited liability partnership, an LLP. And under those circumstances, she can sue for the assets of the partnership. For example, at the taco stand, she could sue us for the, the griddle that we use, the refrigerator that we use, the tables, um, the, uh, the, the knives and the cutlery and, and all those other items that we have, the money we have in the bank account. But she can't sue me for that $10 million that I won from the lottery. 
So you can see how a limited liability partnership is significantly better for the owner than that general partnership or that sole proprietorship. And again, the, the big negative is that it does involve some formalities to establish. But again, if you're a legal professional, you're not too intimidated by uh, legal formalities. So it's very likely that if there's more than one of you who is going to be an owner of the business, um, you are thinking in terms of an LLP as an option instead of a general partnership. Okay. Um, let me put it back here. Let's see if I can make sure I cover this. Um, partners, they share in the profits and the losses. You, you hope that your business is going to be profitable. You hope that you make money, but sometimes it's not. And of course, if the business is losing money, um, it may be that the partners have to pay in some more money to keep the business going. Um, just like in a sole proprietorship, there may be the need to put more money into the business. Um, partnerships oftentimes will have additional legal staff. Um, we'll talk first about, about the attorney legal staff. In a partnership, there are oftentimes two categories, well, there's usually two categories of attorneys. Uh, the partners, in other words, the owners of the business, and associate attorneys. Associate attorneys are attorneys who are on what's called partnership track. Their hope, their ambition, their expectation um, is to become a partner after they have been in the law firm for several years. It's almost like an old-fashioned apprenticeship model. Uh, during that time, uh, it can be anywhere from three to ten years. The um, associate attorney is working hard, learning a lot, proving he, he or she is uh, worthy of becoming a partner. And during this time, the partners are evaluating the performance of this associate attorney. Is this associate attorney sufficiently diligent, uh, sufficiently um, uh, smart and, and, and articulate and good at writing and whatever the skills are that's necessary for this particular practice? If the associate partner does prove himself and, and demonstrates those qualities, then at the end of this partnership track, it's very likely he will be awarded a partnership. Um, now, there's a lot of factors that affect whether an associate becomes a partner. By the way, I'm talking like they're called associate attorneys. They're usually just called associates. There are several factors that um, affect whether an associate becomes a partner or not. One are the economics. If a certain department... Um, is not making enough money uh, to support all the partners that it already has, no matter how awesome the associate is who's up for partnership, it's very unlikely that they're going to make that associate partner because the economics don't play out. It may be that that associate is given another year or two uh, to be, uh, be up for a vote again, but um, other than those circumstances, um, the, the economics obviously have to be there because this is, at the end of the day, a business decision for the partnership. During an associate's period of time where he or she is on partnership track, there's several things that he's or she's trying to do. They want to have high billable numbers. They want to show that they are diligent, that they work hard, because, again, billable hours are like the number of widgets that you produce. If you produce a lot, even if you're not the most brilliant person there, um, you are showing the law firm that, hey, I'm making you money, because, look, every hour I work is another you know, $200, $300 in your back pocket. Another thing that associate attorneys are doing is networking with um, the partners. Once he, he or she wants to be known by the partners um, so that they are invested in this associate's career and that they know, oh, yeah, uh, this associate is charming and nice and diligent and hardworking, and he or she would be a great addition to our partnership. Another thing associate attorneys, this is more as their career progresses, another thing that associate might, may well be interested in doing is rainmaking. Um, when I use the term rainmaking, I am not referring to a dance where you're uh, waving your arms in the air and you're hoping that it will rain, but bringing in clients and bringing in business. This is hugely important for a law firm because obviously if there's no clients, it doesn't matter how many hours people work, no one's going to be paying the bill. So um, if an associate can demonstrate that he has the connections, has the charm, has the salesmanship to persuade clients to do business, then that is a very important plus in his column in his effort to become a partner. So it's, and the reason why I'm explaining to you the motivation of, of associates is so that you will almost certainly be working primarily with associate attorneys. If you understand what is motivating that associate, what he or she is thinking about, then you can uh, uh, 
be prepared to meet their expectations and perhaps to anticipate what they have in mind. So the big things they're thinking about is how can I build more time, how can I impress, impress the partners, and how can I generate new clients or additional business from the clients that we already have. So that's an associate attorney. I talked, though, as if there are only two categories of attorney, the owners, the partners, and the associate attorneys. And in some law firms, that's pretty close to the way things are, but there sometimes are three other categories, staff attorneys, contract attorneys, and law clerks. Staff attorneys are probably the most common third category, and in many senses, they are like associates. Um, The big difference is that they're not on partnership track. There is no expectation that they will ever become a partner. They are, the plan is for them to be in a career employee of a law firm. Now, from a legal standpoint, there's no distinction between being an associate and being a staff attorney, but as a practical matter, there are several very important distinctions between those two uh, uh, positions. First of all, associate attorneys are being groomed to become partners. Staff attorneys aren't being groomed for anything. Um, So usually associate attorneys are given more kind of glamorous opportunities to show themselves and perhaps to fall flat on their face, but at least to have that opportunity to, to shine. Staff attorneys are more likely to be doing kind of the grunt work, the behind-the-scenes work, the less glamorous work. Another thing about associate attorneys versus staff attorneys is that staff attorneys, they're not shooting for the partnership track. So they're more likely to be, eh, I don't want to say lazy, that's not at all fair, but they're less likely to want to have the highest billable hours. After all, they're never going to become a partner, so they, they want to do a good job, but they don't have to wow anybody. Also, rainmaking, much less interested in rainmaking because, again, there's no uh, brass ring at the end that's going to help them uh, turn that rainmaking into a partnership. Uh, so when you're dealing with staff attorneys, um, they want to meet a billable expectation, but they're not focused on exceeding it, and they're less likely to be interested in rainmaking. And, yes, they'll want to network with the partners, but it's somewhat less important for them, and they're likely to be doing somewhat less glamorous work. Another big distinction between associate attorneys and staff attorneys is that associate attorneys usually have more credentials. They're more likely to come from a quote-unquote name law school, a law school that has a lot of name recognition in the community. Um, uh, For example, in Texas, the big name law school is the University of Texas. Um, That that has a a very high status uh, associated with it. There's other, other... very fine law schools in Texas, but, you know, if you were going to say, well, what's what's the one that people like, oh, very good for you that you went there, it's going to be University of Texas. Um, a staff attorney is more likely to have gone to maybe a second or a third tier law school. Now, can a staff attorney become an associate and can an associate become a staff attorney? Yes, there is definitely the possibility for movement between these two ranks. I'll give you an example. A staff attorney might have come from a second or a third tier law school, but once he gets to the law firm, he wows people. He's brilliant. He's a talented writer. He's great with clients. He's got all the skills. Well, the law firm might decide, you know what? We think you'd make an awesome partner. We think it's in our economic interest to put you on that track, and so we're going to switch you from the staff attorney position to the associate position. That has happened. It can happen. But it's not that common. Usually, if you come into a law firm as a staff attorney, you're probably not going to move to associate attorney. But it could happen. Associate attorneys also sometimes become staff attorneys. And there's kind of two paths for this happening. The first is they may not make partner. If they don't make partner, and let's say they were given a couple of years' chances. It used to be, when I started practicing back in the early 90s, it used to be that um, it was up or out. If you didn't make partner, you were very politely shown the door. There wasn't a category of folks who um, weren't going to become partner. Uh, They couldn't still be an associate attorney. Um, That is less true now than it once was. If you have an associate attorney who just wasn't quite partnership material, um, perhaps, or there may be their economic factors that they were partnership material, but there just wasn't sufficient business in his or her specialty, that they might be transitioned into staff attorney. Now, one of the reasons why this wasn't commonly done is because it's a significant uh, change, a negative change in status. It's uh, a little bit um, embarrassing to have that change happen, and so uh, many times the law firm thought it was make, made better sense for that associate attorney to move to another law firm and kind of start afresh there as opposed to kind of being demoted in that way. But sometimes it does happen. 
And many times, instead of be calling staff attorneys, the, the associate attorneys who are not going to make partner are called of counsel. It has a little bit more status. There are a lot of different situations that somebody becomes of counsel. It's not just that scenario, but it has a little bit more a panache associated with it than staff attorney. Another circumstance that some associate attorneys become staff attorneys is at the request of the associate attorney. You may be thinking, well, why would an associate attorney who's on track to become a partner choose to get off partnership track? Many times this is a lifestyle choice. As I said before, associates are expected to bill lots and lots of hours. Well, if you are uh, somebody who has small children, you may find that the hour commitment is really beyond your interest or desire or ability to meet. And so you may say, you know what, I want to get off partnership track, maybe permanently, maybe for some period of time, and go to maybe a 45 or 50 hour a week uh, position, which would be more along the lines of what a staff attorney would do. Um, and maybe I'll get back on, maybe I won't. But the attorney makes that decision. Many times this happens when the attorney, uh, the associate attorney decides to go part-time. I will tell you something. When you say an associate is going part-time, usually what you mean is that the billable expectation drops, but the attorney is still likely to work close to or perhaps even more than 40 hours a week. Um, so part-time doesn't mean 20 hours a week in most cases. Um, and sometimes the associate is allowed to stay on partnership track. Maybe they're just not advancing um, along the partnership track. Or sometimes they are ex expected that they will go down to the staff attorney position. So the bottom line is there's some fluidity between these two positions, but not a lot, a lot of fluidity between those. Let's talk about contract attorneys. Contract attorneys are not um, long-term employees of the law firm. They are on a contract basis. You could call them temporary employees. Um, imagine that you're working for a small law firm and they've gotten a big case and they're preparing for trial. Well, they may not feel that they can afford to hire a permanent attorney because they expect that once this trial is over, they'll go back to having no need for the additional staffing. But they may think for a period of two or three or maybe even six months that they would benefit from having an attorney to come in for some period of time. Um, then that would be a situation where you might hire a contract attorney. And you might uh, find this person, the law firm might find this person on its own, perhaps somebody that it has a, a relationship with, has practiced, or seen the, the practice of this uh, contract attorney. Or um, it could be that they hire this person through some type of agency, some kind of headhunter agency, uh, a job placement agency. A contract attorney's position really is the same as a staff attorney. The only difference is that for a staff attorney, there isn't any expectation that the contract that the staff attorney will leave at any particular time. Whereas with a contract attorney, the expectation is that the assignment will end at some point. Now, many times attorneys are hired as contract attorneys, and again, they wow the law firm, and so then they become maybe staff attorneys, possibly even associate attorneys. So it's not necessarily the case that they have to leave at the end of their contract if the work is still available and they have proven themselves to be uh, good at whatever their specialty is, they may well be invited to stay on indefinitely. The last category of attorney really isn't an attorney at all. This is somebody going to law school. Um, they may want to have uh, some work uh, during the time that they're going to law school uh, to help pay their bills and also to be networking in the legal business and to get some uh, items for their resume so they can show that they have some legal experience. Law clerks, because they are not completed with law school, haven't sat for the bar exam, so therefore they're not eligible to practice law. They have no more right to practice law than um, uh, anyone who has no legal experience or no legal training. Um, having said that, they can do whatever a paralegal could do. Um, and very oftentimes a law firm will um, give law clerks the same types of assignments that a paralegal would do, perhaps even... Um, more assignments or more challenging assignments than some of the paralegals might be given to give the law clerk an opportunity to kind of show what she has um, because the law firm may be trying to decide should we hire this law clerk uh, you know once this law clerk has passed the bar should we hire him or her as an attorney for our law firm so it's almost like an audition um, for either perhaps a staff attorney position or an associate position. So the bottom line is a law clerk is somebody who is not, who's on the, tr the road to becoming an attorney but is not an attorney, and he can do the same things that a paralegal can do, but oftentimes is being groomed for that next assignment, that associate position, that staff attorney position. So that's um, the legal staff a part of the partnership. 
and let's talk about professional corporations. Um, professional corporations, and we'll see this designated usually as P after the name of a corporation are very, very similar to a limited liability partnership. Um, instead of having partners, though, you have people called shareholders. Shareholders have that same role. They share in the profits and losses of the business. Uh, one distinction between professional corporations and LLPs is that you can have a professional corporation with just one shareholder, um, or you can have it with many. Um, a professional corporation is going to have that limited liability, limited personal liability characteristic, just like an LLP. The organizational structure is going to be very similar to a partnership. And as I said before, we have the PC after the name of the company. This is what's called a signal. A signal. Uh, this tells the general public, hey, if you slip on the front stoop of this business, it's a corporation, so you're not going to be able to collect money from the individual shareholders. Let me flip back to the previous slide. And this is another signal, the LLP signal. That will go after the name, and that tells the world at large the same type of information about the partnership, the LLP. If you have a sole proprietorship or a general partnership, you don't have any letters after that because there's no limitation upon liability. Um, the model historically for law firms has been the partnership model. Uh, professional corporations, in fact, didn't exist until the last 20-ish years. So there, it, this, is, this is a relatively new innovation to the practice of law. Um, and as a result, people, st people in the law business still think in terms of partnerships. So a professional corporation, you'll even find sometimes that they'll call themselves partners, even though the correct term is shareholders. Uh, but the same model that we were talking about with partnerships still exists. A professional corporation is going to have associate attorneys. They're not on track to become partner, but they're on track to become a shareholder. And you'll find that they have staff attorneys. They might have contract attorneys. They might also have law clerks. So it's a very similar model, just with different terminology. In Texas, you'll find law firms that are uh, professional corporations and LLP law, um, uh, partnerships. Uh, both models are very common, very reasonable models to have. There are some advantages to one over another, kind of beyond the scope of this class to talk about. Let me flip back to this previous one. There is one thing that we haven't talked about, which is the LLC, Limited Liability Company. It's very similar to a professional corporation. Uh, one of the things that sometimes people don't like about a professional corporation is that it does involve a fair amount of formality to establish, uh, much, much more so than a sole proprietorship, more so than a general partnership, even more so than an LLP. Um, so it does involve several hoops, several different tasks that have to be performed to create it and to maintain it. And that's one of the reasons why professional corporations are um, not you know, the most popular form. Uh, of, of, um, of, uh, for, for law firms. I'd say the LLP in Texas at least is more common. But there are some reasons to prefer it. There is a third model of limited liability, and that is the LLC. You usually have a P in front of it in Texas um, for a professional limited liability company. And this is a mechanism, again, it's only been around about t uh, 20 years, but this is a mechanism where you can have the benefits of that um, LLP, that limited liability uh, for the owners of the business, uh, but you can actually have a limited liability company when you have only one owner. And there are uh, not, uh, not it's not onerous. There's not a lot of hoops that have to be jumped through. So the textbook doesn't talk about LLCs in the professional context, but it's certainly a mechanism that you'll find fairly routinely in Texas law firms. So if you see the name of a law firm and then PLLC, that means the professional limited liability company. Okay, let's talk about the other folks who work in a law firm because certainly attorneys are not the um, only people that work there. In my experience, um, for about every attorney, there's one other staff member. So if it's a law firm with um, 100 uh, attorneys, you're probably going to find that the law firm employs at least 200 people total. Uh, well, we talked about the partners and the shareholders, or the, if we were talking about the LLC, we'd be talking about members is the terminology for LLC owners. Let me just write this over so you can see it here. We talked about the other attorneys, the associate attorneys, the staff member attorneys, the contract attorneys. 
uh, people that might be called of counsel, the law clerks. Um, of course, then you have the category of paralegals. There's lots of different terminology that is used for paralegals. Um, one is legal assistant, the other is paralegal. I've seen other ones like legal technician or legal manager or things along those lines. Um, I wouldn't get too focused on a particular terminology because um, they're used largely interchangeably in my experience in law firms. Uh, before I came to teach at Collin College, I practiced for about 20 years and I had worked with many, many paralegals. And it had always been my opinion that legal assistant was a more um, supportive and uh, professional term than a paralegal. For one thing, the term paralegal is an adjective. Legal assistant is an adjective followed by a noun. And in my life experience, that was the more gracious way of referring to somebody. Um, when I came to to work here, though, I, I saw that paralegals seemed to be preferred within the industry by a paralegal professional. So I went back and talked to several of my paralegal friends and asked them, which do you prefer, paralegal or legal assistant? And to a person, they all said, we don't care. We've heard both. And once I said, yeah, but really, what do you really prefer? Prepare, prefer? And I would say it was about 50-50. Some preferred legal assistant, some preferred paralegal. Um, so that was my experience. I think most attorneys uh, use the term that they grew up professionally hearing. So the fact that a, a, an attorney refers to a job as a legal assistant job uh, doesn't mean that it's going to involve any different uh, responsibilities than another attorney who refers to the same job as a paralegal position. Okay, so um, many times the, the paralegals will fit, I'll put them right here. They're kind of um, a bit of a hybrid because they're legal professionals, but they aren't licensed to practice law. So in some law firms, they will be lumped with the attorneys. In the law firms, they will be lumped with the support staff or the administrative staff. Um, so the other folks that will be working in a law firm are just the, the, the business source, the, the business uh, uh generators or I guess the, the paperwork handlers. You need to have a, um, a mail room. You need to have a library with a librarian who maintains the books. You need to have somebody to fix the copy machine. You have somebody who runs the copy machine. You need to have people that type the documents, um, that distribute the mail, that uh, do the bookkeeping, make sure payroll runs, make sure the bills are paid, um, uh, maintain the website. All of those lovely things that have to happen you got to have that in a law firm too, and so you have lots of different tasks. You have uh, maybe a, a file clerk who is earning, you know, ten, twelve dollars an hour, um, and then you uh, there might be in support staff, and you might have somebody who is a CPA who's running the business side of the business who's earning two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars a year. So there's a wide range of um, responsibilities and uh, pay that might be associated with, with those positions. Once you get started in a law firm, you're likely to experience some confusion about who do I really work for? Who do I have to keep happy? What is the pecking order that's involved in this environment? Uh, sometimes you will report directly to an attorney. I'll show you a common uh, setup that I've seen. You'll have a partner here. We'll call this person partner one. And under partner one, he or she has, we'll say, five associates. And these are partnership track folks. Maybe one or two of them aren't, but for the sake of ease, I'm going to refer to them all as partnership track associates. And we'll say that the most senior is here. We'll give him a one. The least senior is here. We'll give him a five. Um, sometimes what happens is that one of these five is assigned to be the supervisor for the paralegal. Maybe it's number three here. Let's say there's two paralegals in this group. So we'll have paralegal 2 and paralegal 1. So this is, quote, unquote, the boss, uh, attorney 3. Um, and you might, at first thought, think, well, this is a person that I have to make sure is happy with me because she's signing my appraisal. She's approving my time off uh, and my vacation and all that good stuff. And so this is the main person I have to make happy. But probably that's not the case at all. Um, the real person that the paralegals are probably going to want to focus on making happy is this partner. 
Now, in some cases, the paralegals may work very closely with a partner, but there are some times where the paralegal may not interact very commonly with the partner at all. So the partner may hear primarily about the work of the paralegal through his or her communications with the associates. So even though you don't necessarily interact directly with this person, this person's opinion is likely to establish you know, whether you get a bonus, what size your increase might be, and whether you continue to be employed in this law firm. So don't get confused about who your boss is on paper versus who your real boss is in terms of success in your organization. Sometimes the person who is given the responsibility for supervising paralegals is the new person. It might be this person over here. And the idea is this is unbillable work, the time that you spend supervising. So why not give it to the attorney who has the lowest billable rate? There's an argument for that. Another thing is that, that it's an opportunity to develop this newer attorney. This attorney is kind of at the bottom of the uh, the pile in terms of, of um responsibility and, and seniority, um, and he can de be developing some of those leadership skills, some of those management skills um, by supervising some paralegals. So sometimes that's what happens. Sometimes the um, paralegals might report directly to the partner. Um, if that's the case, though, still though you're going to find that you're working direct, uh, in many cases, for the attorneys here. Um, you might, it's not unusual to have a, a paralegal assigned to work exclusively with a partner, but many times you will find that you'll work for a combination. So the bottom line is your partner ought to be the, the person that you're most focused, or if we're in a corporation, of course, this would be the shareholder, you're most focused on making this person happy. And then, again, you these you all want to make happy, but the farther the person is up the chain of command, it's a little bit more important to be treating those people well because, after all, they've got a better chance of making partner, and they're more likely to be working closely with the partner. So what they pass on to the partner about your work performance is likely to carry more weight with the partner than maybe what this newbie is saying. So the bottom line is don't look at technical, formal chains of command. Always keep in mind who the real person is in the organization that establishes your career path. Sometimes paralegals don't report to anyone in this organization, but they actually report to uh, maybe someone called a paralegal manager or lead paralegal or something like that. And this person uh, may cover the annual appraisal, maybe the one that uh, arranges for coverage when one of the paralegals is, is off on vacation or say, out sick or something like that. And again, you might be tempted to think, well, this is the person that I primarily have to make happy. But no, again, this person is more of a um, paperwork filler outer than actually having a lot of authority. Um, if the partner says to the, part to the paralegal manager, hey, paralegal number two is not working out. We need to get rid of him or her. The paralegal manager isn't uh, really going to be in a position to say, oh, I disagree. I mean, he may say I disagree, but at the end of the day, if the partner says he's got to go, this paralegal manager is going to see that the, the paralegal goes. Um, he, the partnership manager, the paralegal manager isn't a partner, isn't even on partnership track because he's not an attorney, and so he is an employee. This is the owner saying what needs to happen in the business. So, yes, you obviously want to keep your direct a manager happy with your work. Um, that's a smart strategy. Uh, this person does have some input into what your career path is going to be. But if you're stuck, do I make my partner happy or do I make my paralegal manager happy every single time? You need to keep your eye on the ball. This is the person who is most important for your long-term success. Here's an organization starting to throw in the textbook that shows you one method of how a partnership might be arranged. One thing we haven't talked about are secretaries. When I started practicing, secretaries were ubiquitous. Um, a secretary would typically have three people on her desk, maybe four, a partner, a junior, a senior associate, a junior associate, and a paralegal. And that was very much the pecking order. The partner's work got done first. The senior associate's work got done second, the junior associate's got work got done third, and the um, paralegal's work got done fourth. I, when I started out, obviously was the junior associate. As a practical matter, the secretary never got to my work. Uh, and she was a good, good secretary. It wasn't that she was being lazy. She just, there was too much to do. So my work was almost exclusively handled by the word processing department. 
Um, so I worked very closely with people who, who were not my direct secretary but were an excellent typist who could turn around documents quickly. Back then, in the dark ages, uh, attorneys and paralegals did not have access to keyboards to type. Um, the concern was that if we had gotten that access, we'd mess up the system and cause the whole thing to crash. So I didn't even have the option of typing up my own work. Nowadays, of course, it's a very different environment. Paralegals and attorneys type up much of their own work. Um, and so you will very likely still have a secretary assigned to you, although you might just need to deal with word processing. But you're also likely, just like the attorneys will be doing, doing a lot of your own typing. But it's an important thing to keep those secretaries and word processors happy with you because you never know when you will need to use them. And, of course, um, they oftentimes have a very, very close relationship with the partners and the more senior associates. So if you tick off the secretary, it's very possible that it will get back to the partner. And, and uh, many times the partner will consider his or her loyal secretary more important than any of the attorneys or the uh, paralegals with whom he works. I'm going to end this uh, presentation at this point, and we will start during the next presentation on employment policies. Thanks so much for your attention.